Beautiful. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, Toadstool Bookshop is very pleased to have uh, John Forte joining us tonight to talk about his new book, uh, Heirloom Gardener. Um, John Forte is a garden historian, horticulturist, and ethnobotanist who has directed gardens for Plymouth Plantation Museum, Strawberry Bank Museum, Massachusetts Horticultural Society, and Bedrock Gardens. He also serves as a regional slow food governor and biodiversity specialist for Slow Food USA. He has won numerous awards for historic garden preservation and children's garden design, and he received the 2020 Award for Excellence from National Garden Clubs, the largest nonprofit volunteer gardening organization in the world. Uh, John has served as board chair for the New England Unit of the Herb Society of America, and he received the Nancy Putnam Howard Award for Excellence in Horticulture from the HSA. He lectures nationally and he reaches millions globally from his Facebook page, The Heirloom Gardener uh, dash John Forty. Uh, follow him at www.j40.com. And um, so just to let everybody know, we are recording this and we will put um, the recording on our website in the days following. Uh, so you can rewatch if you so choose. Um, we will be taking questions. We'll do so at the end. And um, if you wouldn't mind just posting your questions to the chat, and then at the end, I can uh, um, uh, have John, John answer them for us. And uh, additionally, I will post the link uh, to purchase his book on our Toadstool Bookshop web website. And um, without further ado, uh, please welcome John Forte. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's really wonderful to be here with all of you. And um, I have to say, I really love Toadstool and it's great to have you hosting. I think most everybody watching probably knows how important it is to keep our local bookstores thriving. And um, so to have a place like this to go to makes a world of difference. So if you don't have the book, I do hope You'll reach out to them afterwards and order a copy for yourself or for the holidays. So what I thought I would do tonight is take you on a little bit of a tour of the book. Um, it's something that is a collection of essays, basically because there were so many different topics in horticulture that I hoped to cover. Um, Initially, when Timber Press reached out, and I'm sorry about that, uh, they'd asked me to write a book on garden history. And I feel like these days we're all looking at history in a very different way. And it's important to find things that we, we can learn from the past. You know, we're throwing out a lot of history right now. We're re revising ways of looking at things that are more inclusive and it's sort of like looking at biodiversity in our gardens and landscape to me. So it became important to think about a way to, instead of just writing another book about the Olmsteads and other uh, famous people in garden history, to create a, a book about plants and skills that we can borrow from the past that not only help preserve important things that before they slip away, but also things that can help us create more sustainable futures and more wonderful gardens in our backyards. So I ended up creating the Heirloom Gardener, Traditional Plants and Skills for the Modern World, and having the great fortune to have a wonderful um, woodcut artist named Mary Azarian do most of the woodcuts in the book. and. To me, it's just a pleasure to hold and to look at. So I take, I'll take you on a little tour of the topics um, in the book. Um, so first is really uh, one of the things that you'll find is carried out throughout, you know, carried on throughout the book as a theme, is looking at gardening as a craft, really as a, a fine art of gardening almost that we can carry through life. And you know, I might not be a person who's going to be more adept at my computer work as I get older, but gardening is one of those areas that we really do grow older and wiser. And every year, I think gardeners know they have an opportunity to make a fresh start. I think that's why gardeners tend to be a little bit more hopeful sometimes than the, the rest of the, the crowds around us. 
But even so, these have been trying times that we've lived through. And really, I wrote this book during a lot of pandemic lockdown. And um, so I've always loved this woodcut by Mary Azarian on the left that says, when the world wearies and ceases to satisfy, there's always a garden. And I think so many of us find refuge in the gardens that we keep, find beauty in creating them and sharing from them. And so that's at the core of the book. Also, too, running through it is understanding how important a sense of place is, because more than just our gardens, our gardens are an integral part of the landscapes that they are nestled into. When we have a connection to a sense of place, it does a lot more to endear us to care and stewardship of that place. Um, for me, I had the good fortune to be raised by a river, really. And, you know, this is the modern interpretation of the course of that river where I grew up. This is a historic uh, postcard of that river. But this was me swimming in the river of the Fox Hill shipyard landing that was at the foot of the hill across from our house. And we saw red fox playing in our backyard. We could find the old nails from ships that were built centuries ago and see in our landscape stone walls running through deep pine woods where I grew up. And from the time I was young, it made me curious about why there were orchids growing wild there, why there were stone walls running through woodlands, why there was a well on the property. and coming to understand this both as a place of the Wampanoag, who were the First Nations of that region, to a place where farmers uh, were building ships and farming those lands along the banks of the river and using those stone walls to separate fields and pasture. And that those native orchids were called moccasin flower by the Wampanoag or lady slipper by colonists or called by me something that I had to start digging up colonies of and learning how to save from bulldozers that continued to build along the banks of those rivers. To me, those were acts of preservation that I understood as much as I understood raising these families of rabbits that were being broken apart each season. They were connections to land that brought me back in many important ways. Linda Hogan is a Native American writer and she says beautifully, walking, I am listening to a deeper way. Suddenly all my ancestors are behind me. Be still, they say, watch and listen. You are the result of the love of thousands. And that place, that connection really helps us remind, helps remind us what we are preserving. The Irish speak of it as tenelach, uh, you know, the relationship we have with land, air, water, and nature. The Japanese speak of shinrin yoku or forest bathing, recognizing that even the chemical constituents in the trees around us have physical effects on our body and our mind and our whole well-being. And that when we have that connection to place, to our history in that place, that again, we become stewards in it, in every backyard that we ever tend. So I want you to think back to who taught you to love plants and the natural world. This was my mind on plants as a kid. I was full of wonder at what I found around me. This is one of my neighbors uh, just down river from where I live now or uh, along the river um, in the hull of an old apple tree that still produces apples, but finding that same sense of wonder in a landscape. Another child playing in a children's garden that I designed for the Massachusetts Horticultural Society, finding true joy, ecstasy in that garden, because gardens should inspire us. Rachel Carson, who is responsible for so much of the bipartisan legislation that helped our nation rethink what environmentalism could mean to us, could mean to our quality of life, said, if a child is to keep their inborn sense of wonder, they need the companionship of at least one adult who can share it rediscovering with them the joy, excitement, and mystery of the world we live in. So in my book, I try to find ways 
to help us, I'm sorry, uh, to help us explore best practices from the past that can help reconnect kids. To me, it's one of the most important things we can do because as you see with this graphic on the bottom right, studies are showing that on average, kids can name fewer than 10 animals and plants in their backyards, but that they know hundreds and hundreds of corporate logos. And to me, that is uh, a horrible testament to uh, a system gone awry. And so to me, the whole book is about finding common ground and looking at new systems, new ways that we can build into our culture environmental change that we can participate in one backyard at a time. And I think especially for kids when they are coming into a world where maybe they feel very helpless, it's another way to get them engaged in the changes that we can make and in daily enjoyment of our outdoor spaces. So one of the chapters I write about is making herbaria. In the past several hundred years, kids would go out botanizing with their families and with tutors, and they would press botanical specimens to make an herbarium. This image here on the bottom left is a page from Emily Dickinson's herbarium with pressed Queen Anne's lace and all heel and wallflower. This one is of nasturtium. And when kids would press specimens, they would label them to the best of their ability with common, sometimes with Latin name, sometimes with recipes or saying, you know, found at grandfather's grave, grandmother says it's used this way medicinally or cooked this way. Um, and it became a lifelong heirloom keepsake for all the children that were raised to know horticulture and botany better because of it. It also gets into establishing habitat, fostering habitat in our own backyards, because when we plant out or enable the native plants to shine through, that native lobelia is going to bring, about, bring around the hummingbirds. When we leave the leaf litter and needle mulch, we get the fireflies back and the mockingbirds and whippoorwills and butterflies and crickets and moths and tree toads that were part of many of our upbringings, but that we've watched slip away at dramatic rates in just recent decades. We know that when we plant things like the spice bush or sassafras, we get the spice bush swallowtail and their amazing caterpillars with uh, false big eyes to scare off predators. Uh, and ultimately we end up building green bridges from our backyards to our neighbor's backyard, to our community, and to the green corridors that are created, green bridges for the pollinators around us. Something as simple as a, a plant of mountain mint. We did a citizen science project one day and counted 17 different native pollinators on that mountain mint. And that's just one plant planted that reminds kids that they can make a difference when they're playing in habitat. It's also sometimes just retiring our weed whackers and letting spaces return to plants like milkweed that give new habitat back or old habitat to monarchs, meadowland and um, pasture, open space that isn't mown. So you get the bob white and the quail back clean habitats that let walking stick uh, come back around or leaf litter on the ground that lets salamanders rebuild habitat. Because really our backyards are not just habitat, they are whole communities. And our kids, like those <laughs> fireflies and the bluebirds, they're part of that habitat too. And we raise very different kids when they think of themselves as part of a habitat. The first year I planted Ilex verticillata or winterberry in my yard, I put several branches into some urns outside my front door. And that winter in the first snowstorm, I saw a flock of 11 bluebirds land on them and eat every berry from them. First of all, I'd never seen bluebirds in my yard before, but they instantly found that native berry. And as they ate them, I'm sure put all of those berries back out into the wider environment with fertilizer packets to grow out the next year. 
And that's a very important part of the habitats we establish with plants like that or viburnum is that they then grow out into the adjacent areas as well. So for me, as I write in the book, I always love to start thinking about the native layers in a landscape because there's not always a lot of native plant use in our history that wasn't overlooked. For centuries, most of the native plants were counted as weeds by a lot of the early uh, immigrants that came here and colonists. Um, and so for me, it's always great to start with something like Joe Pye weed that used to grow along the edges of fields and in marshes. It was named for Jopi, a uh, uh, powwow or a medicine man among the Wampanoag. Um, planting out crops as well, like beans, corn, and squash uh, is a great way to utilize native uh, planting patterns uh, and fertilization to bring a piece of that past back in our region. And not just the three sisters, but also their companions along the edges of fields, things like groundnut, Apios americana, that's this beautiful legume-like flower that has an edible root tuber that early colonists write helped save them during many starving times. Uh, and Jerusalem artichoke, um, some people know them as sunchokes, a great late fall blooming plant that also produces an edible tuber after frost and all the way through early spring. These are among the first acts of horticulture and, and culture and civilization. I loved one of my first research projects when I got to the Massachusetts Horticultural Society. I found their oldest emblem or logo. And beneath this image of a Massachusetts native, it says the first act of civilization. And it shows a native farmer. And I have to say at this point in our nation, I think it's a good time to remember civility as well as civilization and what we can accomplish as we garden and as we find common ground together. So another way I write about in the book to do this is foraging. I think there are a lot of lessons to learn from the past about foraging, but when we do go out and gather things from the nature around us, we become more keenly aware of habitat and the health of our environment. We find ways to utilize what's present, whether it's you know foraged apples or mushrooms, um, elderberry or beech plum or grape, uh, these are black walnuts, rose hip that you can make tea from, or even things like sumac. This one seed head of staghorn seed sumac has 500 times the vitamin C of an orange. So long before we thought you had to buy Minute Maid to get through winter and to get your vitamin C, we knew that we had all kinds of regional, local alternatives to provide that, like the rose hips and the sumac. If you think back to growing up, I think most of us grew up foraging. It might not seem like that. Your parents probably didn't say go out and forage, but Brooklyn hipsters don't own foraging. We all grew up foraging for blueberries and blackberries. Uh, they're, they're just a part of how we learn to trust working with nature. But also in the book, I write about foraging not just as an act of harvesting from wild places, but cultivating a lot of the plants that you might have foraged so that you're actually rematriating them and building habitat back. This was this is my friend Kathy Gunst when we were doing a story for NPR on wild leeks, which are called ramps. And not just saying you should go out and harvest them, but really how to save seeds, how to take rootlets and replant them. And at this point, from six little rootlets and some seeds, I have an entire colony uh, overtaking the back 40 in my yard where I can harvest ramps from my own space and contribute back to that native landscape. So in the book, I write about several different plants as features, but one of them is fiddlehead. And I think of fiddlehead as one of the best plants as an example of something that you might forage that you can actually grow in your yard. Fiddlehead is also known as ostrich fern, and they have these beautiful fronds that can grow sometimes even three to five feet tall. So they're a beautiful part of a tall border of perennials 
in a shade garden or even a sun garden once they get established. But they're also that first edible green of spring that's kind of like the moxie of New England greens. It's a, a great pungent flavor of spring and peat and earthiness and green. And so many of the chapters get into things like that, along with these beautiful woodcuts from Mary Azarian. The book also explores old ways that can help us learn from the past to foster a more sustainable future, whether it's exploring some of those native ways of planting or building out raised beds or put, uh, keeping plants in pots that we can overwinter, learning how to build cold beds and hot, uh, hot frame and cold hot, hot beds and cold frames, uh, old planting patterns like vine teepees to maximize harvest, but also adapting it for kids today to be a, a wonderful play space. And just finding these things like espalier that really served a different past, but also fit beautifully into our urban yards today. Those old ways, they remind us that there have come, that there have been so many other times in our history when we had grown more distant from nature and that we had to reconnect our populations. During World War II, the nation turned on a dime. And the Victory Garden movement came together as, un as the government with universities and cooperative extension services and garden clubs and churches and everybody banding together helped reteach a population how to garden, how to can, how to create compost and have an effective garden. And at the height of their success during World War II, almost half the nation's produce was grown in backyard victory gardens. This is an image of one of the Portsmouth victory gardens, Emma Pecunis, whose garden I um, helped restore uh, several years ago. But today, what I love is that during the pandemic, our nation came back to that place where we now have as many people gardening as we did during World War II. And back then they would tell kids, Join into this, take up the weapons of war, spades, shovels, and hoes, get rid of your excess lawn, and build a productive garden. And that's the sort of model that I love to look to. The school gardens movement that reminded us that not every kid's going to learn this at home, so we should take gardens into schools and make that a basic skill set that teaches students science and math and social studies, as well as hands-on skill, skills that can be even better than gym outside to get them a break from the classroom, but learn about the way that the earth works in consort with our lives in a household. Thomas Moore says, the ordinary arts we practice every day at home are of more importance to the soul than their simplicity might suggest. When I found this image in that, I saw my grandmother and it reminded me of so many afternoons spent harvesting beans from a garden, sitting together as a family, taking the tops and the tips off of those beans, snapping them, getting them ready for the pot. And, you know, with Thanksgiving around the corner, I have to say, I think there are a lot of families that are having harder conversations. And sometimes in a nation that's this polarized, it's important that we just sit around having some conversations like we do snapping beans or cooking a meal together. Talk about things that are green and instead of red and blue, but maybe spend time together reviving some old recipes, saving and sharing some seeds. But remembering that what we do in our own house every day makes the biggest difference, makes the biggest environmental impact as well. And that it's in those little daily choices by what we purchase, what we grow, how far it's shipped, that we make a difference in our environments. So in my book, at the core of all of this is, is the discussion of heirloom plants because really they are our common cultural inheritance. Because they're open pollinated, people have been able to save the seeds and hand them down for generation after generation after generation. And with each time we save seeds, 
We're adapting them to the soil in our backyard, to the light, the length of day, the length of season. We're choosing the ones that are most fruitful, have produced the highest yield or the most disease resistant. That doesn't take hybridization, it takes selective seed saving. Over time, between hybrids and GMOs, we started to create seeds that you could not save, that actually sometimes pollute the genetic diversity that was our inheritance, but also disenable us to continue from seed to table, an age-old connection that as any school child in a school garden can tell you, is one of the most important ways to know where our food comes from and one of the most easy ways to remember that we can make a difference with something as small as a seed that we can hold in our hand. This is a seedsman's chest from 1870 that's in the New Hampshire Farm Museum. And in that seed chest, there were over 17 different seed houses from New England. Those have all gone away. Because after World War II, most of our seed houses were bought up by the chemical companies that by patenting, by creating a hybrid, are able to patent it. And that comes down to a matter of ownership versus an open pollinated heirloom, which we all own, which we all inherit. This is also important to me because of what this chart demonstrates. Uh, this chart was in National Geographic a few summers ago, and it demonstrates how in the last hundred years, we've lost over 90% of the genetic diversity among the food crops that fed the world. You know, we had almost 600 varieties of cabbage. Now we have fewer than 30. We had over 400 varieties of tomato. Now we're down to 70 odd tomatoes. It seems like we might have the world in our supermarkets, but what we've lost is every region having its uh, favorite green that overwintered, a tomato or an apple that it was famous for. All of that regional variation went away when the seed companies bought up seeds and put most all of their efforts into developing seeds for the Midwest where agri agriculture was centered. So what I've tried to make a part of my life's work is finding those heirloom seeds of place like these. These are seeds found in the walls of a house in New Hampshire, a cranberry bean. And through my work with slow food and museums, making it so that that bean became something that every farmer in the region wanted to grow, every chef wanted to cook in a restaurant and every farmer's market would sell. I did the same with the eight row multicolored flint corn at Plymouth Plantation or the white carrots that were also found in the walls of houses so that we can be bringing back these important seeds and have that diversity back, not just have a Brandywine tomato that's from the Brandywine Valley in Pennsylvania, but have the tomatoes that were grown by our ancestors right here. All of that's getting more possible now because we're seeing this resurgence of local farms. In terms of sustainability, that's critical because on average, our food is being shipped to us thousands of miles. And that's not a sustainable pattern, certainly for petroleum use or cost, but also, as uh, John Muir says, when we try to pick one thing apart from the rest, we find it connected to everything in the universe. When we have these small integrated farms, we're better able to grow bulk grains nearby, homegrown seeds, we're able to have crop diversity and grass-fed livestock, um, compost and manure that keeps the soil rich. Um, we're able to produce clean energy in those spaces, have fruit and nut orchards. And again, make it so that the things that come a distance are the true extravagance and the things that are grown local, a matter of rebuilding jobs and local economies and preserving farmland for a future when we most certainly won't wanna be shipping produce thousands of miles. That whole thing is part of what I celebrate in this book because I don't know about you, but I never imagined that we would see year-round farmers markets back in our lifetimes, any farmers markets. It seemed like a thing that had died. Um, and by having those farmers markets, 
it's enriched so much biodiversity, but also flavor. I don't know about you, but I grew up in an age where Wonder Bread was about all you could buy in a supermarket, where canned peas and spinach were pretty routine things. But by the time we started to develop a local food uh, and local agriculture uh, presence, we brought back so much of that biodiversity and truly fresh flavor as well. In this time when some days I just want to hold my head in my hands at the state of the world, I think it's also important for us to celebrate that we've grown the number of farmers markets in America from just under 2,000 to well over 20,000 in less than 15 years. And they are thriving and farm uh, distribution centers and farm stands are also hugely on the increase. And I think a lot of us realized that those connections to local food sources were even more important during the recent meat scares and food distribution trials during the pandemic. So to me, it's a very important connection. And Michael Pollan had a great way of saying that the farmer's markets are also the community gathering spaces in America now. It's where you really do get to know your farmer and see your neighbor and support a local baker and a local fisheries person, somebody who's canning up and preserving things or giving you real fresh produce. And as Michael P Pollan quoted me, quoting my little old Italian grandmother said, it's better to pay the grocer than the doctor. These things, these markets are really our pharmacies as well. So I also work actively with a group called Slow Food. It's sort of a, a movement that grew out in opposition to the fast food movement and all the trash that goes along with that and the shipping and the poorer food quality because all the money spent on advertising, but reminding people to find the traditional foods of place and celebrate those and the recipes and slow the pace back down, get to finding ways to eat meals from home with friends and loved ones. May Sarton had a wonderful way of saying that everything that slows us down and forces patience, everything that sets us back into the slow circles of nature is a help. Therefore, gardening is an instrument of grace. To me, it's finding that place in our gardens, in our yards, where we're remembering the taste, the flavor of something truly fresh, and also what it means to eat the fruits of our own labors, and know that that food is our culture, and it's our identity and our wealth. The book also gets into exploring things like orga organic gardening as a craft. I don't know anybody that wants to poison the earth, but most of us lack the skills to grow things organically. But there's been so much science, so many wonderful ways from the past that we can be learning from and borrowing from and new generations of thinking that the book also gets a lot into wonderful organic ways that we can all carry out at home that remind us how to build soil, how to build um, a forest floor with layers and layers of uh, habitat enriched edible plants, working with deep rooted plants or uh, plants that work well in arid climate, uh, the more arid climates that we're being, that we're contending with and finding ways to see the enrichment that comes of organic versus synthetic. And know that as our grandparents would have said, it's just food, you know, this isn't organic versus something else, but it's what you get to practice and learn how to do right at home. Because if you are what you eat, these days we're eating a lot of petroleum and the shipping and the chemicals versus the new science that's helping us analyze the nutritional value of food and sometimes food that has been fully, that has fully achieved ripeness in place in the sun can have as much as 70% greater nutritional value than the foods that were harvested on ripe, shipped a few thousand miles, gassed to turn them red. And then we wonder why that tomato was stone hard yesterday and it's mush today and it still doesn't have flavor. That's the system that we were handed, but one that local agriculture or backyard gardening helps us 
create alternatives to and build community around and build better systems. Because if you don't want the food you eat raised like this, we have these other options when we, uh, we grow it ourselves or we grow it in farm markets. Elder Leopold said, we abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. But when we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. And that's what I try to bring forward throughout the entire book. So I want all of you to think about how the pandemic might have shifted the way you live, the way you gardened, the way you ate. I think for so many of us, what we found is we were going out into our yards and gardens, making salads from place instead of going, jumping in the car and driving 40 minutes there and back to get a few things. We learned to use what we had in the house and in the garden to put together a meal. And so one of those things that I think a lot of us got reacquainted with during pandemic was our gardens, our kitchen gardens. You know, it's such a simple way to grow the things you know that you love the best. And as their history shows us, those kitchen gardens were typically always right outside our back doors because when it's right outside your back door, you engage with it. Whether it's a simple raised bed kitchen garden like this one that I designed for the oldest house on Nantucket, or this incredibly elaborate kitchen garden uh, behind a house in Belgium. They are ways that can feed and nourish not just our bodies, but our minds and our souls. It's exercise as well as an escape from the radio and the TV and a connection to the wildlife around us, but also most importantly to the, the nourishment that comes to table and to our kids who more often than not have no idea where their food comes from, that a carrot grows in the soil or that they can start a seed and turn it into something like that tomato. It was also a time to reestablish gardening as a craft, something that we become better at, something that we learn from. So understanding how to build those raised beds and the cold frames, how to trellis plants, how to dig uh, and turn the soil and uh, grow seeds, learning how to can and put by food for winter, but also getting to know the plants we grow and why they serve as they do. Something as simple as sage you know, we've got Thanksgiving coming around up around the corner. Every person that ever made stuffing always knew to put sage in their stuffing. Well, today we understand that sage is antibacterial. And instead of worrying about the bacteria count in the cavity of the bird, they just knew that they would put sage in stuffing. And yet it becomes synonymous with the flavor of that holiday. Those are skills that we build in over lifetime as a craft. Maybe also doing things like learning how to graft a fruit tree or to prune. Louis Neiser says, a man who works with his hands is a laborer. A man who works with his hands and his head is a craftsman. But a man who works with his hands and his head and his heart is an artist. The book really delves into the art and craft of gardening and making our backyards into something more of a homestead, whether it's just a stoop, uh, some stairways that we can put some pots out on outside of our apartment, or a backyard that we can craft into a small urban plot to feed ourselves or to recreate and feed ourselves, maybe a laundry line uh, to create some good alternatives, uh, a workspace outside, Maybe you, like some others during the pandemic, started keeping chickens or bees in that yard. Um, it was a chance to plant a farm garden again and to remember that we can grow things ourselves and that a little bit more homestead makes a home a whole lot more homey. It borrows from other craft ideas from the past, like using wattle. Um, you know, when it comes to sustainability, we've become so accustomed to going to jumping in the car and buying something that was gonna land in a landfill two or three years down the line, the cheap plastic fence that feels like such a bargain, but ultimately the cost to the environment is so much greater. But then when we learn skills like 
taking the free fall, the branches and twigs from our yard, the um, water sprouts that we prune from our orchards or the coppice or pollarded trees that provide us, we can build these beautiful compost bins and raised beds, um, arbors and arches and fences with just the sticks that you can find in your own yard and things that will last as long, certainly as any of those cheap plastic fences. The book delves into how to turn that homestead backyard into a place where you can grow small yard fruits. Things like uh, the dwarf apple trees, quince, currants and gooseberries, elderberry and raspberries, blueberries, and even things like pawpaws and cherries and cranberries that can all easily be grown right in your own backyard that benefit us as well as wildlife for food and for medicine. It also gives us a chance to connect more deeply with the plants and understand how many of them have medicinal attributes that are simple ways to reconnect with well-being. Bill Berry says, herbalism is based on relationship between plant and human, plant and planet, human and planet. Using herbs in the healing process means taking part in an ecological cycle. For some, for many of us, we grew up with herbal medicine but we didn't always think of it like that. You went for a cup of chamomile tea or mint tea if you had an upset stomach. Um, these are simple things, but somehow we started to forget that we owned that knowledge because we had a pharmaceutical industry with something to sell and a fear of nature that was taught to us as well for all the remedies that could be sold. But what we've been learning more and more is how many of these plants are only really useful in their true form. Case in point would be kale, one of the poster children of the local foods movement. As soon as science proved that it was good for colon cancer, the pharmaceutical industry instantly tried to turn it into a pill. And we realized that it had no effect on the body whatsoever. And we realized sometimes we just need to eat our roughage. And these whole plants are much more chemically complex. So that cup of tea, that kale stew or salad is going to make a much bigger difference for our body than that um, the pill that we bought. And really back to the idea that we all grew up with medicine, with herbal medicine, we knew garlic and echinacea were for our immune system. We knew prunes kept you regular and that spinach and beets were good for iron and fennel for digestion and oranges and tomatoes for vitamin C. It's about reclaiming some of those bits of knowledge and using them fresh for teas and recipes that we make in our kitchen borrowing from traditional learning that reminds us that things like wasabi were always used with raw fish because it's a vermifuge and you could get intestinal worms if you didn't use it. Understanding that comfrey, also known as knit bone, had a long history of being used for wounds and broken bones and that today we actually realize through science that it regenerates cellular growth, looking to those past practices and really building them into our future. And sometimes that's also a fun future because a lot of these herbs had their way into beers and ales and gruets long before hops came onto the scene. And we used to drink seasonally. And uh, many of those plant names tell us that. Things like ale cost, mugwort, ale hoof. They were all traditional brewing herbs along with things like spruce tips and sage ale um, and all kinds of traditional herbs that I've had the good fortune to brew with a lot of uh, brewers from all around the country. Um, here are some local brewers. This was over at Portsmouth Brewery and Dogfish Head Brewery. Uh, I think at this point, three, three presidents have now drunk ale from our New Hampshire gardens uh, made with traditional herbs. Um, it's also making wonderful cocktails and cordials from our gardens. And the book, whoops, the book explores ways to turn things like elderberries into a cocktail that's also a winter medicine. It's a, 
you know, if, if you live through a New England winter, it's really good to have a cordial, something that makes you more cordial in winter. But if it's cho cherry or cherry, we also know that it's cough syrup. If it's elderberry, it's an antioxidant and that it's an expectorant for the lungs and for flu. So it's having fun making cordials and cocktails like these that we make for an eco-culinary institute that we ho hold out on Appledore Island uh, with the Shoals Marine Lab at, and uh, Celia Thaxter's garden. And knowing that they're great for us to have through the winter, but they're also great for gifts as well. Thoreau said we need the tonic of wildness and these plants, these uh, herbs can also become tonics and bitters that are fun to play around with in the kitchen, um, but also at the bar uh, or in, a, in our teapot. Another thread that runs through the book is living seasonally. Instead of trying to, you know, be like the person who thought canned peas and spinach were great because it helped us defy the seasons, to learn how to celebrate rhubarb when it's in season or sweet potatoes and potatoes and squash at this time of year and um, celeriac and potatoes. You know, moving through the seasons was something we did and it became a way to keep connected to all of these seasonal holidays. And for every holiday, you'll find in the traditions associated with it, whether it's holly and ivy or strawberry and rhubarb, it just comes down to what was in season at the time of that holiday and reconnecting with those early traditions. If you're not out farming, start maple syruping early on. And as Ralph Waldo Emerson said, it also becomes the alternative to not supporting things you don't want to support. In his day and age, it was not buying sugar from slave plantation owners, but instead making sure that you spent your money to support New England farmers who made a livelihood from maple syruping and sugaring as well. So the book dives into a lot of those seasonal celebrations and customs and food ways, things like making sorrel soup with May Day or asparagus making May wine with sweet woodruff and rose or candied angelica, or just getting your neighbors engaged, bringing May baskets or gathering together outdoors and reveling in those seasonal changes together in community. In a similar way through seasons, I write about reeds and other artifacts of seasonal living because traditionally reeds were meant to remind us of the wheel of life, to be this portal on our door that showed us that we keep moving through the seasons. And even when we're down here and it seems like things are never gonna move and progress or that it's spring and it's spring's never gonna come, it's winter, that we're gonna just keep moving in circles through our whole life and celebrate those circles. So I save my pruning projects to build the very best of what I can gather from my yard into a wreath at any time, whether it's the leaves of autumn, cones and sumac of winter, lavender and sage of summer, or this midwinter solstice mix in that wreath. They all become artifacts of that seasonal living. As do in their own season, the edible herbs and flowers that we can gather that so enrich our diet, but also our mood. You can be making salads rich with every edible in your garden or making things like a syrup of violets or ice cubes with edible herbs and flowers, herbal honeys and vinegars like this chai vinegar, uh, herbal jellies like the violet jelly, or making herbal cheeses and butters when you get to know the plants in your garden, you get to know things that would never appear in a supermarket because they're impossible to keep fresh. When you have something like your Solomon seal blooming and you eat those fresh flowers, they're like garden peas in spring, but floral garden peas. You'll never get these things from a supermarket, but it also lets you eat what all the old herbalists would say are the sweetest essence of the plant. So I also dive into things like the language of flowers and how we use them sort of like emojis from the past, but much more elegant than that. Um, and ways that we shared from our gardens with others, all the way to exploring how lawns evolved and how maybe we can let some areas go back to meadow and flowery mead, put by some of our weed whackers and grow out spaces that, you know, this is my lawn in spring. 
it's not a monoculture green grass, and I've reduced the overall size of my lawn probably by two thirds, but I can also harvest all these things for food and medicine and beer and have fun working with these things from the garden, as well as support health and well-being, not just for myself, but for all the pollinators that I share habitat with and the fireflies and the birds and the wildlife that visits my backyard. When I leave those edges to go to seed, like the milkweed in Mary Azarian's woodcut or the Joe Pye weed and the ironweed, I get back those fireflies by the tens of thousands in my yard. And I can look across the street and see five in my neighbors. There's a huge contrast to what we can do when we grow it out appropriately and when we maintain organic practices. E.B. White says, I would feel more optimistic about a bright future for man if he spent less time proving that he can outwit nature and more time tasting her sweetness and respecting her seniority. So I want you to think back to who taught you to love plants and nature and ask you who, are you, who you're mentoring now because all of this shouldn't die in our heads. It should be the stuff that fills the, every child's head with imagination and dreams and participation. Give them hope to know that they can affect change from their backyard and take inspiration, as Rachel Carson would have said, from that adult who's taking them through and showing them. But also know that the next generation has a lot to teach us. And so while you might want them to put down their phone, they might be doing some research online while you're telling them your experience with a plant that's live and real as well. It's a time to share back and forth between generations. And again, more green conversations around us. So with that, I'd love to say, I hope you will, um, if you haven't read the book, I hope you will uh, find a copy or if you have uh, generations that you're not connecting with as well as you'd like, maybe it's a great gift for your grandkids or your nieces and your nephews or your, your friends, but I hope you will uh, take advantage of our hosts uh, tonight and get copies from Toadstool Bookshop. Um, and um, with that, I would also say I have a page on Facebook called The Heirloom Gardener John Forty. I hope you will go there right now and uh, follow the page. I, I try to post daily things that are seasonal and on this on a similar range of topics so that it always stays new and engaging for gardeners. So with that, why don't we turn this to some questions and I'll just say thank you. And also next year when we're reopening, come out and visit me at Bedrock Gardens where I'm the executive director. It's in Lee, New Hampshire, and it's a wonderful place to learn more about gardening. So do we wanna take this on to some conversation and questions? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so yeah, I think I'm speaking for everybody when I say that was a great presentation and uh, I'm quite inspired to read the book myself. So um, a lot of positive comments in the chat. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, Erica was the first one to have a question and she asked, she would like to know which ferns to eat and which ones not to. So... Around the world, there are many ferns that are eaten, but in our region, it's the, the safest plan I would suggest is ostrich fern. Um, and you can, again, buy it in your, at your local garden centers and see it clearly identified as ostrich fern and plant it in your own backyard. But that's a great starting point. There are certain plants like mushrooms and ferns that it's great to start with maybe a mushroom spore kit uh, and grow them out if you're interested in foraging and get to know things really well before, you know, you just gather something you don't know as much about. But certainly it's another way to build community and do these things with people that you know that really do know their topics and their plants as well. I also want people to feel free uh, if they want to ask um, John a question directly. Um, you're, you're, you're more than welcome to. OK. 
Okay. Uh, well, I'll go right ahead. I was just going to say, um, we've got some uh, holidays coming up ahead. And I do think one of the things that I would love to suggest to people is uh, as you're spending time with family, you know, we've, and friends, many of us over the years have become accustomed to the sort of presentation style. You have people over and everybody comes together and you present them the perfect meal. Well, one of the things I think happens is we spend a brief time together and we go away and it's over. But it's a great time to, you know, if you're needing to put your garden to rest, build in some time in the gardens together. See what you can learn from the different generations in your family together. Maybe take time and challenge people to bring some family recipes or dishes uh, that you can prepare together. If you've saved seeds from your garden, share some seeds with people. Or if you're making a squash that you got at the farmer's market or in your backyard, save some of those seeds and give them to friends that come. Um, Seed saving is a wonderful thing to explore, but another wonderful way to share out biodiversity as well as an important cultural shift that we're all able to help bring back around. Uh, Katie was curious. Uh, she says, uh, I'm looking to plant some edible natives. And if I plant chokeberry, what can I do with the fruit slash rest of the plant? So if it's choke berry or choke cherry, there's a difference, but both can be used in teas. Choke berry is aronia. Um, and I actually, uh, when I was working in the Boston area, I was finding it in a lot of Russian supermarkets uh, and I learned to put it in my tea uh, from those markets. And I love it as a, a great antioxidant in my tea and it adds a, a deep fruit flavor to it. Um, the birds, of course, love it as well. Choke cherry um, is something else that makes an amazing cordial. In fact, maybe one of my favorites. The first recipe I ever saw goes back to about 1813 um, in Plymouth Colony and then some others from uh, uh, around the same period down in Virginia, but you take choke cherries and at the time with the triangle of trade, they would put them in rum, let them steep for one to three months and then sweeten it. And it makes, well, first of all, it makes a cough medicine because choke cherry is a great cough medicine, but it's also wicked delicious as they say in Plymouth Colony uh, these days. Um, so both of them have great use and again, great plants to introduce into our landscapes or to just let re-inhabit our landscapes when they arrive. Uh, this is a good question here. Um, I'm actually curious myself. Julie, Julie asks, uh, what would you suggest for raised beds other than the wattles? I know I uh, oftentimes see a lot of rotting boards when it comes to raised beds, like maybe uh, there's a type of wood that'll last a little longer. Or... Mm -hmm. So two things. I do find, yeah, I, I think it's great and worthwhile to invest in things like cedar boards. Um, an old method, again, learning from old ways that I've seen through archaeobotanical evidence in several of the museums I've worked at is people would char the post beneath the ground or the back side of the board. You'll see it on the outside of houses in Japan sometimes as well. And that charring of it makes it last much longer. But also I don't consider my utility gardens an object of great beauty. So if my boards are rotting, I might do a lot of patchwork, but I can get 10 years out of a good board in a, in a garden knowing that it doesn't have to be in perfect shape. But if you do want that, I think it's best to go with cedar and you can even char the back of it with a blowtorch and that will help. Um, so that's one of the best to use. Stone has a long history of use here in New England as well. And building raised garden beds out of stone is a great way to do it. Typically people would build raised beds that were about eight feet long and four feet wide and then keep alleyways between two and four feet between them so that they could get into the space between and work on weeding those gardens and harvesting from them easily. 
But the main point in all of that was to fill that garden bed to the very top with the best soil and every year to add compost and manure to them so that you were concentrating the richest soil in the spaces where you wanted to grow. But a lot of gardeners will also rotate and they'll build long mounds instead of raising beds with boards or stone and just each year turn it over into the space where the alley was before and leave the old space as the new alley and um, just continue to turn over long rows of hilled earth instead of thinking you even have to raise a garden uh, with costly material or found objects like wattle or board or stone. Uh, Lee would like to know any tips for processing those black walnuts? <laughs> yes, that's a great question. Uh, I'm going to sound like a real boozer, but, uh, you know, you can take the green unhulled walnuts and turn them into a liqueur uh, known as nocino in Italy. Uh, and you get that beautiful fragrance of the green walnut hull as well as the walnut flavor. But in order to get the nut meats from them, what I think is really important is let them sit for about a month. You know, you break away the hull. That part's easier. And um, then just take the walnut itself and let it sit for a good month. And then the nut meats pull back from the shell. When they've pulled back, it's that little bit of shrink allows you to take them out from the hull much, much easier so that it's not so great a struggle. And again, back to the way we spent our holidays, you didn't buy a bag of shelled walnuts and everybody sat around eating it. You sat around cracking open walnuts and pecans. And again, it just becomes another in road to conversation and a more casual time spent together. Again, having some different levels of conversation than we've grown accustomed to in the fast pace of the, the modern age. Uh, Maureen would like to know, are there ground covers that are heirloom? Oh, sure, so many. And I would say, I always try to think first to the native layers in a landscape that we can help restore. and. You know, recently I watched a house construction of a McMansion just down the river, well, at the end of my dead end street. And they scraped up a full acre of wild native strawberry, carted it away, and then brought in horrible topsoil when the project was done. Native strawberry is one of my favorites. Um, there are two types. Um, but both of them hug the ground and um, they provide beautiful flowers. You can mow them. They provide fruit for us and for wildlife. So that would absolutely be one of my favorites. Um, a lot of us that have shady yards and spots in our landscape can consider things like um, wintergreen and um, tea berry. Um, wonderful native ground covers that also are fruiting. Um, I'm sure I could think of many others. Um, a lot of the shade plants are coming to mind, but um, I would say that's a good starting place. Um, and also, because I know there are better answers that I could give you to that, uh, get on my Heirloom Gardener Facebook page and ask me there, and I would give you a far, far more detailed answer as well. Uh, Erica has another one here, and it's a, it's a good one because I'm sure uh, there's a number of people wondering this, including myself. How do we eradicate invasive bittersweet? It's killing our forests here in New Hampshire. It is a problem. And I mean, there is a native bittersweet, but it's not commonly found. Um, it is a plant that's very easy to pull up as a seedling. Um, but I would say the first thing we can do is make sure that we pull up those seedlings. They, the roots are very yellow um, and uh, something that is easy to pull out. If you find mature specimens, just cut them off at the ground, let them die in the trees, and then pull them down and then keep trying to manage the population. But above all, don't... Um, don't make bittersweet wreaths go out on your door because the same thing that applied for the winterberry in the urns outside my door applies to bittersweet. Every time they find that and eat the berries, they're spreading it further into nature. 
Uh, is there, uh, Andy was curious, is there a variety of clover that can reasonably be accepted as native? So most of the clovers are introduced. I don't find any issues with clover. And, and in fact, they're really wonderful ways to introduce nitrogen into the soil in our lawns and provide important um, food for our pollinators. So I'm not gonna be able to recommend a native clover to you, but I would certainly still recommend clover as a great thing to mix into our lawns as well, as, as into our teapots and, uh, and tinctures. It's great food and medicine. Well, thank you, everybody. It's really been a pleasure to be with you tonight. Nice to see some familiar faces here as well. And uh, I hope I will see you out in the world sometime soon. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. Um, again, we will have the recording for this video uh, posted on our website, toadbooks.com, in the next uh, few days here. And uh, please come by and visit our stores in Keene, Peterborough, or Nashua, or uh, just visit our website and order um, Heirloom Gardener from there. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Have a great night.